Hey church, we are back with week one of our crew podcast as we journey through the gospel of Matthew. It's study week, week one, and I am so excited because I have got Pastor Chris Foster here. Give him a cheer. Thank you for the overwhelming response. Overwhelming response. Um, Pastor Chris, we love you. You kicked off our uh, study season last year in the book of Ephesians and really our first crew podcast. So we thought we'd bring you back for study season one in 2024. Pastor Chris, pastors at Awaken City in Rockingham. He is one of my best mates. He is an absolute legend. I love him more than a chubby kid. He loves chocolate cake. 100%. If I could have said it better, I would have, but (laughs) I can't. We're digging into Matthew. Uh, So let's just begin right off the bat. Uh, Mm. As we look at scripture, uh, we don't just look at the verse on the page, but we've got to understand its context, uh, its authorship, its purpose. Yeah. Um, And so tell me a little bit about Matthew. Yeah, well, uh, hey, Matthew kicks off the New Testament. Uh, if, if you're starting at the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew gets things rolling. But it's interesting that I'm always mindful of somebody who's new to the Bible mm. and if they pick up a New Testament for the first time and they're able to get it through the fact that the Old Testament's there and yeah. it's leading up to the coming of Jesus. New Testament's about Jesus being here and what he's wanting to do in and through us. Mm. The first four books in the New Testament sort of are going around and around the same thing. Yes, it all covers the life and ministry of Jesus. Yep. Really. In the turn, the Gospels, mm. the, the account of the coming of Jesus and what he came to do. Um, and so I first think of how I approach all four Gospels and then how they sort of fit in different seasons. Yeah, Matthew's purpose seems to be he's trying to convey the fact Jesus is the king we've all mm. been waiting for. Yeah, And this thing, this, this hard thing to get our head around, kingdom of God's here. Mm. And it's almost like he sets the scene for everything that comes after. Yeah. Yeah, and and interestingly, it's been ordered that way, but perhaps not even written Mm. in that order as well. So it's not necessarily that Matthew was the first one to write the gospel, but it is the perfect beginning for us to set all that scene up. And he sets it up with in a kind of odd way. Because I'm thinking about that first time reader of the Bible as well. And they come, okay, I've been told, read the gospels. You know, the the first half it's different. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, how often we coach people in that way you know the book's not really well it is meant to be read from front to back but also you can begin here sure and then they turn to page one and they read Abraham was the father of Isaac Isaac was the father of Jacob Jacob the father and he begins with the genealogy but it's not without purpose it's loaded I I believe it's Um, it's loaded like what do you see in there well Matthew, first off, Matthew is one of the two eyewitnesses to write his account. So Matthew was one of the 12 chosen by Jesus to be on his sort of, his, his, his active crew. Yeah. You know, walking yeah. with him from place to place. But Matthew's original deal was he, he was a tax collector, most yeah. like, you know, and, and he's pulling money from his people. He's hated yeah. by everybody. Yeah. But he has this total transformation as he begins to follow Jesus. Mm. And it's interesting that as he's writing his account, he starts with this idea of what it means to have been waiting for a king. Yeah. And he starts by listing off the line that Jesus comes through. Mm -hmm. And he lists the the first key name that comes out is David and then Abraham. Mm. Now, I think that's significant Mm. because he's saying, first and foremost, David is this example of the perfect king. Yeah. Perfect king with flaws because he's human. But the picture of the king they've been waiting for, the yep. warrior king. In Jewish king. history, yep. yep. The one who sets things up. Yep. The one who, who conquers the enemy. And, and yeah. he very clearly says, hey, Jesus comes from that. Yeah. But not only does he come from that, he mentions Abraham next. Mm. Abraham is the founder of the nation. He's mm. the man of promise. Mm. So you've got the fulfillment of the king who is also fulfilling the promises of yeah. God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. David and Abraham. And then so the names meant something to that audience. Yep. When they read that, it's like, oh, is this who we've mm. been waiting for? Mm. Yeah. Because it's not a it's not a succinct li- uh, well, it's not a complete list either. It, and that's how we know that it's in those I think it's 14 names in 14 three sections. Yeah. Yep. He's Very telling symbolic. the story. He's doing subbic here. Very symbolic. He's he's drawing yeah. to David being this key king. Yeah. And so yeah. Yeah, 14 names, bang, 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 bang. Yeah. Because he, he's, he's telling a story through the families of others. Mm. Mm. 
I love that. I, I also love this aspect that there's three women in here as well. Oh, yeah. There's, there's Tamar, mm -hmm. Rahab, mm -hmm. and Uriah's wife, which we know is Bathsheba, mm. um, the woman who David slept with, took, right. took from, yep. um, and uh, Rahab, prostitute, yep. Tamar, adulterer. Yep. And so these three women are very uh, purposefully placed in this story as well. Well, at least for me, I read that and I go, here's people who are sinful, yes, but God takes yeah. and makes part of his story, yeah. uh, which is what he's doing. Redemption. With all of us. Yeah. Uh, it's a powerful thing. I, I wonder whether God's less concerned with sin as being a, uh, a don't do this, as seeing sin as a sickness. Yeah. And, and what if Jesus is the remedy? Mm. Yeah. And, and these people who others would not have chosen, the key thing is they didn't persist in those lifestyles. Yeah, yeah. They journeyed out of them. Yes. But it's almost like their journey out of it led to the physical coming of the Son of God. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, incredible. And it reminds me of what we journey through. Wherever we come from, as long as we journey out of it, what is God doing through it and what will he have come out of us? Yes, yeah. Because we're part of the story of God too. That's it. Well, we're, we're a continuation of, of this line ultimately or, or at least we're grafted into it. Absolutely. By our faith in Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we move through the story of the Magi arrive mm -hmm. from the east. Um, Jesus is born. The shepherds come. Uh, the King Herod, he's upset about it, um, but they escape. God's hand douche. again continues going. And, uh, and then we get the story of John the Baptist preparing the way. Uh, baptism of Jesus, incredible moment. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then Jesus is tested. Mm. He goes into the wilderness. Uh, what's going on in that moment? Well, we're not given privy to a lot. Mm. Like the, the scripture goes on to say that he spent 40 days and 40 nights out there being tested. Mm. And uh, we don't know whether Satan was there by his side harassing him at every point or whether he appeared there at a, a critical junction. Yeah. We definitely know that Jesus chose to go without food and water. Yeah. And it's interesting that this moment uh, that precedes it is John the Baptist has just declared to everybody, hey, here's the dude we've all been waiting for. Seems like a really triumphant moment. Yeah. And, and that's the first encounter we get to the, the bigness of God where mm. you've got the Holy Spirit landing on him yep. and the Father speaking from heaven. There's yep. the Son in the water. There's, God's big. Yeah. And, and here he is in human form on the scene. And then instead of pressing into that like he's grandstanding. Yeah. Like you'd think in a natural context, you'd say, all right, let's get the crusades pumping people. Yes, I am here. Gather. Hey, gather. Get those tents going. Yep. Yep. Optus Stadium. I've We're got filling my platform. out. My followers yep. are building. Yep. John, John's <laughs> passed it to me, guys. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting that instead of that, it goes to this. Mm. He goes by himself into the wilderness, which is a loaded term. Yeah. The wilderness, the, the wilderness journeys under Moses and mm. walking around and around and having God deal with things. And he goes into the wilderness, yet he's without sin. Yeah. There's no issues. And he is put on trial. Yeah. Because the way Satan comes to him and tests him seems to be it's, it's, it's like a, a, a reverse of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Mm. Mm. Where... You know, Adam and Eve see the fruit and they, they see that it's good for eating and they imagine what they can get out of it and they desire this thing. Yeah. And it's like Satan comes before Jesus and says, I'll, I'll, I'll do this and I'll give you this or test God this way. Yeah. And Jesus as the, the, the ultimate Adam yeah. faces that and does not succumb. Mm. So that as he comes out of that, that's what he's leading us into. Yeah. It's almost like this picture of apart from me, you're living your life in the wilderness and these pressures are at you continually. Mm, mm. It's like the, 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 the lust of the flesh. You need this to be happy. Yep. If you get this, you will be fulfilled. No, let a crud. Yeah. Man not. does not live uh, for bread alone. No, because yep. you're going to be hungry again. Yeah. When we live from desires, nothing's ever enough and we escalate. Mm, mm. And there's this idea of... Um, my faith in God doesn't depend on everything being perfect all the time. Yeah. I, I don't need to live this life where I've got angels 
carrying me, fluttering me from place to place. That's good. I live in a broken world and I'll journey through it. That's so good. And so it comes out of the wilderness having faced all that so that we can find our freedom in him. Mm. I'm, sort of, I'm just sitting here taking it all in, learning. Uh, the, way you, uh, the way you succinctly wrap up the scripture uh, is just inspiring and, and super, super powerful. Um, and so I want to say thank you. Thank you no, so much for coming down with us. Um, thank you for feeding me. And I know feeding so many people on the other side of, of that camera as we meet up during the week, kicking off our study season again. Uh, let me ask, is there anything we can be praying for as a church for Awaken City in the coming year, months, uh, weeks even? Oh, I appreciate that. I, I think I, I love the fact that you and I get to build a friendship mm. and a camaraderie in the midst of ministry. But even more than that, I believe in this idea of sister churches. Yeah. We're not in competition. Yeah. We're not in conflict. Come on. We recognise that Eastlake, you are called in a unique aspect of God's grace to minister in the way that you are. Yeah. As much as Awakened City is called in its unique aspect. Yeah. And while no one local church can express the bigness of God, all of us doing what God's called us to do does. Is a message to the world. Yep. And um, to pray for us, pray that we continue to forge ahead yeah yeah to take new ground yeah and to be a blessing with our brothers and sister churches mm. in the region mm. so good well we'll be praying for you thank you so much for journeying through this we've kicked it off and i can't wait to see what it does in our church in the coming study season i love it rock on matthew <laughs>